Hi everyone attending. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, my name is uh, Nick and with me is Gonzalo uh, from CIN as well, the NGO organizing this webinar. And with us today we're happy to host Dr. David Die, who will be talking to us about uh, recent challenges and discoveries in uh, big eye tuna science, which is uh, a topic of particular importance for NGOs, since obviously being a marine conservation NGO, we we focus on, on the ocean, oceans in general, but in species which are of particular relevance for Portugal. Um, so, so this is a very interesting topic for us. Um, and we know that it's for a lot of entities and people who we work with as well. So we thought that this would be a nice a nice way to, to discuss a little bit about Big Eye Tuna, its relevance, uh, what's going on with the population in the Atlantic and so on. Um, that uh, we know that the timing is not the best for some people because there's a lot of people on holidays. But uh, since we're going to have an ICAT panel one meeting soon, we thought that this would be an interesting timing to to talk about this. Uh, so, Gonzalo, if you want to uh, give a few words just as an intro, uh, and then we'll we'll go to Dr. David Diaz's presentation. And during the presentation, please feel free to. Uh, leave any comments or questions in the Q&A box, which you'll find in the bottom of your screen, uh, since we'll have a Q&A session just after uh, the presentation. And again, Davidia, thank you very much for accepting uh, to, to do this presentation for us. And just a note for the participants, the, the webinar is being recorded, as you probably saw already. So it will be made available online on our YouTube channel, and we'll send you the link um, afterwards so you can share it possibly with colleagues or, or friends. Very, very quickly. Thank you, Nicola, to for the intro. Uh, I won't add a lot. I will just add my my personal uh, thanks to to Dr. Davidia for for hosting this, uh, for participating in this webinar. Indeed, big eye is often the, one of the lesser species of of tuna, especially if you compare with with bluefin. But it is very important for for Portugal, as as Nicola said, and it's been under the site of Siena for 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 a long time, and and many other organizations. So it's very good that you accepted to do this with us. And indeed, it's uh, it's not the perfect timing, but uh, as as Nicola explained, we, we wanted to do this before uh, next week's uh, ICAT um, panel one uh, intersessional. So thank you very much. I see I see a good crowd already joining, uh, and yeah, we'll we'll talk after Dr. David D's presentation. Thank you. Let me know the feed screen now. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Can you see the screen? Okay. Yes, perfect. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Siena, for uh, Saina. I don't I quite know how to pronounce it properly in Portuguese, but uh, thanks so much for inviting me to, to present today. It's a pleasure to talk about Big Eye. And as, as you probably know, I'm a professor at the University of Miami, and, but I've also been the coordinator for Tropical Tunas now for a few years, and uh, I'm the rapporteur of Big Eye Tuna in, in ICAT. I must say that uh, it's a pleasure to speak to all of you, and I hope that we'll have interesting discussions after the presentation about, about some of the issues of science that supports big eye tuna management. But I, I want to make it clear to everybody that I'm speaking in, in, as, a, as a personal um, scientist that is involved in big eye tuna. I'm not representing the, the views of ICAT at all during, during the seminar. Or the, or the views of the University of Miami, of course. Um, so I just want to just uh, give you some idea on what I'm going to speak about. I will uh, talk a little bit about uh, putting a context of Big Eye Tuna in, as, as a commodity, but also on the, the science that I'm going to speak about, the context of the science that I'm going to speak about. And I think in the introduction, it was clear that it is the science that supports management and conservation. I'll speak a little bit about the big eye tuna fishery. I won't go into the details uh, of the Atlantic tuna fishery, but I'll, I'll give you some idea of, of some of the characteristics. And then I'll shift towards, I think, what most people are interested in, some of the recent improvements in big eye tuna science that we've had and that are 
helping us improve the advice that we provide to the Commission, to the Atlantic Tuna Commission. And uh, finish talking a little bit about some of the challenges that remain and how we plan to address those challenges from the science point of view. So you all know that all these large fish, like the large tunas, are uh, really highly prized commodities, both from the point of view of seafood markets, but as well from the point of view of uh, sport fishing. And uh, big eye tuna is not one of the most uh, sought after sport fishing um, uh, targets, but it, there is also a sport fishery for big eye tuna as well. And, and in certain places, sport fishing is actually more important. You know, sport fishing for these tunas and large billfish are, is more important economically than, than actually the commercial fishing for seafood. Um, because of their perceived value, both from sport fishing as well as from uh, the commercial value, they've been often in the forefront uh, in the news. And you know, I'm sure you're all aware about bluefin tuna and how much it was in the news in the 2000s about how miserably it was doing. That has changed for many reasons, uh, partially because the Eastern stock has improved the, the status. But in the more recently, big eye tuna has also been quite a bit in the news again, for reasons related to its conservation and management status. So it's, you know, there's been plenty of reporting about the fact that the stock in the Atlantic in particular had been um, assessed to be overfished and, and, and going over uh, and, and being subject to overfishing. And why is, why is this? Why is this particular um, focus on the on the on these species of, of fish so um, big that it makes it to front page news in in national and international newspaper well it's all about the fact that we try to manage these particular populations we don't manage all the populations uh, in the marine environment but certainly the ones that have, are high, high value like big eye are managed and we manage them for three clear purposes that I think we need to remember because they drive the science that we do to support this management. We manage, ma we manage them so that they will be sustained in the future so that we can rip the benefits that we get out of these benefits in the future, at least in the, in the human scale future. We also manage them to optimize their harvest and their conservation, making sure that the, whatever actions that we take allow us to, again, uh, obtain the maximum or the optimum benefits from either conserving or actually uh, producing the, the, the species for seafood. And we also manage them in terms of deciding who is actually going to um, have the benefits of the resource. So we manage the allocation among different stakeholders and different users. In, in the science we, that we do, and that we especially we do in ICAD, we focus mostly on persistence and optimization. We do a little bit of research on allocation, but at least in the RFMO world, in the regional fisheries management world, allocation is mostly driven by politics and, and economics, not so much, not so supported by, by science, at least not as much as persistence and optimization. So what kind of science does the ICAT support? Well, it really supports what we call actionable science, which means science that is actually going to produce either data or, or tools or analysis that help support the decisions of managers. And it can be it can be just the information, but also guidance on how to use the information. So communications of the science that we produce is a really important part of the job that we are all engaged in. <coughs> One a very important example of this actionable science is the program that was funded over the last five years from ICAT, which is called the Atlantic Ocean Tropical Tuna Program. And it was designed to be a, a research program that actually provided the kind of information and the kind of experiences and training that managers could act upon. A lot of the science that I'm going to be talking about today comes from this AOTTP program, which by the way, is almost finished, but it continues in, in a, a small way. 
<coughs> I apologize. So tropical tunas, I'm pretty sure that many of you in the audience know quite a bit about this, but tropical tunas, the three major species, skipjack, big eye, and yellowfin, are really characterized by being obviously uh, mostly an equatorial and tropical uh, and subtropical resource. You can see in the maps that are maps of catches by different types of gear that the majority of the catches of the three species are in the eastern part of the Atlantic in the tropical areas. Some species like big eye extend more to the northern areas and, and one of the reasons for that is that big eye is a tuna that actually prefers habitat that tends to be colder water than the other tropical tunas. Uh, it sits often below the thermocline, which means that it can actually thrive in colder water than the surface waters in the equatorial, but it, and, and it allows them to basically move towards more temperate areas where, where water is colder, at least in their adult phase. The majority of the catches of um, big eye are made by these three gears, by longline, baitboard, and persane, and you can see that they are actually Whereas longline is uh, ex extends throughout the Atlantic, big eye catches tend to be in sp specific areas. Uh, sorry, big eye catches for from bay boat tend to be in specific areas, like the areas of the islands, um, the Azores, Madeira, and um, Canary Islands, as well as some areas on the in the uh, equatorial uh, Gulf of Guinea. Longline, on the other hand, is much more widespread. Bait boat, again, it's um, like per se, tends to be also mostly in the equatorial areas, especially in the Gulf of Guinea. Per se, the majority of the catches come from per se, and they tend to be of uh, small juvenile fish. So in 2018, ICAT um, conducted the SCRS, the Scientific Committee, conducted an assessment of Big Eye, which was the first time where we reported that this stock was in a um, bad situation, that it was uh, suffering overfishing, that's why it's above that horizontal line of one, and that it was actually also overfished. That's why it's in the left of the vertical line on one, that you see each of those lines represent different hypotheses about the population model that we implemented for Big Eye in 2018. And the symbols represent the endpoint, the most recent assessment of stock status, which at the time was for the year 2017. You can see that all these endpoints of these spaghetti plots end up in the red zone of this um, figure which represents an undesirable state of the stock. It represents a state where the stock is overfished and suffering overfishing. Whereas the green zone is where we, the, uh, the managers would like the stock to be, one where it's not suffering overfishing and not being overfished. The lines actually represent the evolution in time from a virgin stock to the right to the current overfish and suffering overfishing stock in 2017 on the left. So that was the state of that we produced in 2018, and it was the um, advice that we provided, which led the commission to react and take some additional management actions for trying to revert and improve the state of, of, of uh, big eye tuna. And those included uh, some reductions in the total allowable catch which you can see in this graph is represented by the blue lines, the blue line that you see on the right of the figure. That represents the catch limit, the total allowable catch um, that ICAT has been imposing on countries that are members of the commission since basically the early 2000s. You've seen that looks like a stair because that total allowable catch has been reduced twice uh, since the beginning of the 2000s and more recently in 2018 in response to our advice that the stock was uh, overfished and suffering overfishing. The figure also depicts the catches, the historical catches from the different major, long la major, la um, major fishing years. You can see that the majority of the historical catch was on uh, coming from long lines and bait boats, 
but since the 1990s, the per same catch has increased. And in fact, in the recent times, is about a third of the total catches come from per same, and they are made on juveniles, fish largely. And that's the reason why ICAT has been also imposing restrictions on the catch of the per sains. They've done that through, um, through fishing closures of the fishing that uses fish aggregating devices. So the per sainers that use fish aggregating devices have a closure that uh, initially did not allow them to use these devices in particular areas of the tropics, a closure that now has been extended for uh, the entire Atlantic for the per se in, for two months in the early part of the year. All these regulations have actually helped the, uh, and are aimed to actually reduce the actual catch. You can see, however, that in recent times, uh, the total catches, which are depicted by those orange shades, have been actually greater than the, than the actual limits. And that's for two reasons. One is, the main reason is that not all countries actually are subject to the limits that the TAC imposes. And some of those countries are able to catch um, beyond what uh, we expected or the commission expected and therefore why those uh, catches have actually exceeded the, the total allowable catch. The more recent estimates of catch for 2019s and uh, potentially for 2020 suggest that actually the catch has dropped over the recent years, but we don't have a complete data yet. So it looks like at least over the last two years, maybe, maybe the catches have not exceeded the tack like they were exceeding it in the 2016, since 2015 to 2018. We'll, we'll still have to confirm that. What we do, however, we use this information on the catches together with two major sources of information, which are the relative abundance indices, which drive the assessment. And recently we've used uh, one of the indices that uh, drives most of the assessment is the index of, that comes from the long line observations, from the long line fisheries, which as I said, tend to cover the entire ocean basin and, and therefore the entire distribution of big eye. And that is the graph that you see in the right and it represents an estimate of relative abundance coming from primarily the logbook data that the fishermen provide. And as the catch rates decline, we assume that those are a reflection of the abundance declining. You can see that is actually broken down into two colors. And that's because even though that it corresponds to long line, we know that there was a shift in the end of the 70s and beginning of the 80s from fishing from shallow water tropical tunas to deep water tropical tunas like Big Eye. They shifted the gear and we were we are unable to actually t account for that shift in our statistical analysis. Therefore, we consider that those are two different relative abundance series broken at the time at which uh, that shift largely happened. Uh, what you see from those series is that since the um, basically uh, mid 80s, the, there was a strong decline in the relative abundance of big eye tuna. And then in more recent times, since the 2000, that uh, abundance has been uh, more or less at the same level, kind of fluctuating, but not certainly regaining strongly uh, the levels that were uh, in the early 80s. On the left hand side, that, that index, by the way, nowadays comes from putting together the da data sets from many countries. Traditionally, we've had individual countries providing indices of their own, derived from their own fleet, but lately in ICAD we've been able, and that's been a really large improvement, we've been able to put the data sets together and have a consolidated what we call a joint long line index. In, in this particular case, it includes the, uh, the, the fleets of, of several of the major uh, harvesters of big eye. On the left hand side, you have an index that we've been developing in ICAT over recent years, and that is derived from the activities of the per But it's not 
actually derive from observations from the fishermen, but it comes from the observations that the fishermen share with us on the acoustic sensors that they have on the fish aggregating devices. These fish aggregating devices attract a school of tropical tunas, including big eye, and uh, they, over the last 15 years, they've been equipped with, uh, um, with acoustic devices that allow the fishermen to interrogate the sensor and get an estimate of the total biomass of fish under the fish aggregating device. Scientists from uh, Spain and France have been developing the methods to use these acoustic signals to be able to develop a relative abundance index. And they do that by using the signals of the, that are coming from the buoys before they, these uh, fish aggregating device has been actually harvested, before a net was set. So in theory, they represent catches uh, or biomasses uh, uh, observe before the fisherman actually catches. They tend to be uh, independent of fishing, but not independent of fishermen, since it's the fishermen that deploy the buoys and the fishermen that provide us the, the, the data. Because they uh, represent the biomass of fish aggregated underneath a fish aggregating device, they represent juvenile catch they represent the juvenile biomass, not the adult biomass. The long line tends to represent the biomass of adult fish. The acoustic buoys index uh, represents the biomass of, um, of juvenile fish. And you can see that over the period that you have in this graph, which by the way is only, excuse me. <clears throat> I apologize, is only from the 2010 to 2019. You can see here that there is a more recent tendency, at least of the juvenile biomass, since the 2013, which looks like there's been some increases of biomass. V could just be reflection of increases in recruitment of particular years, not necessarily obviously the biomass of the entire stock, since this probably represents two or at the most three age groups in the uh, juvenile phase. So what do we know about these animals in terms of their, their populations? Well, we do know that the uh, adults distribute throughout the, the ocean. You can see the long line catches in light blue. The circles represent higher catches. In red, you have the catches from the persane that are being done on fish aggregating devices. And you can see those are much more restricted to the uh, areas closer to the coast, not so much in the uh, areas north or south of the equator. They are mostly equatorial, which confirm our knowledge that these fish go to the Gulf of Guinea to reproduce. And then as they become subadults and adults, then they start um, moving to other areas of the ocean and only coming back to the equator areas to reproduce in the spawning time. Through the recent program of the uh, AOTTP, we've actually learned a lot more about the, some of the more details of this migration. What I just showed you is, is what you can infer from the catches, but in the AOTTP program, we had uh, conventional tags, we had uh, satellite pop-up tags, and we also had uh, archival tags put into big eye tuna. There were about uh, 30,000 uh, big eye tuna that were tagged with conventional tags and uh, a few hundred with the archival and satellite pop-up tags. And one of the, some of the things we've learned is that uh, at least for the populations that are in the eastern part of the stock, they, uh, subadults, tend to have some strong honing among the islands of the Canaries, the Madeira, and, and Azores. So they back and forth for a few years of their life from those um, islands. And, uh, and we know that because not only from some of the satellite tags, but also from the conventional tags, that they actually keep moving uh, from one island to the, one set of islands to the other. As the, as the seasons change. They do sometimes obviously come back uh, to the more coastal areas of West Africa, 
and we have continuous movement up and down the coast of mostly the, the juveniles as they grow into sub-adults. So that again is something that we've learned from some of the tagging we've done on the, on the TUNA program. You can see here uh, on the uh, y-axis you have the number of days at liberty, so in going up uh, fish that have been uh, recaptured over longer periods and each of those ellipses represents a, a, a year of recovery. So the ones at the bottom are animal fish that were recovered after a year, then after two years and after three years in the zone of Azores, Madeira, Canary. So you can see that for at least three years, they keep coming back to the same area that they were actually released initially. Um, so there is ev strong evidence of homing. From the data from the pop-up satellites, we, we have a lot fewer information, unfortunately. Uh, much of the successful um, deployments have been from fish that were released in the western part of the Atlantic, and the fish that have been released in the eastern side, we've had a lot uh, less success into tracking them, and they've moved quite a bit less than the ones in the, in the west. We know that the Western fish are much older and, and potentially this reflects the differences than that Western fish from those fish that are in the East um, that we are able to, to tag. But the bottom line is that this data remains insufficient to characterize, characterize migrations at, basin, at the scale of the basin, at least the satellite and the uh, tracking on archival tags from, from Big Eye Tuna. Another big um, improvement we've had recently on the Big Eye Tuna from the Tropical Tuna Tagging Program was uh, in regards to the aging of fish. You can see that aging on Big Eye Tuna now is most successful when it's done on autoliths, by sectioning the autoliths, and uh, it is still remains a challenge. You can see the, the marks on the, on the photograph on the left how you can see the annual bands, and, but it is a, something that requires a lot of skills and something that this ICAT has um, invested quite a lot of resources into training, particularly scientists in the developing world at some of the techniques of, of age reading. Through this research, we've seen also that um, autoliths of juveniles can be age with daily ring bands. You can see them on the photographs that I'm showing you. The yellow line on the left is the uh, line that we use for, the, for instance to read the bands. It's not a straight line. You have to find the areas where the daily bands are more obvious when you do the uh, age estimation. So you can see that that changes from uh, area of the uh, autolith section depending on the age of the fish. But you can see on the right hand side uh, the micrograph photograph that you can see the daily bands pretty easily and, and they're really easy to count. When you graph the number of counts of bands that you see in the lower figure, the count of micro increments against the length, you can see that they certainly reflect growth. As the animal gets bigger, you count more bands. So it's cer they certainly reflecting growth. Now, do they reflect age accurately and precisely? Well, we've actually seen that unfortunately they do not. You can see on the upper left-hand side, the relationship between the annual age estimates. These are by reading the annual bands on autoliths with the actual age estimated from the daily bands. And you can see that even though in theory they should all fall in the, along the one-to-one -one line, they do not. The daily age tends to provide a lower age uh, than the annual age. And I must say the annual age is actually, uh, we don't just use the number of bands, but also the time at which the animal was collected to estimate a fractional annual age with the annual banding. So that shows uh, that the daily age tends to underestimate the animals, uh, the fish's age. And that was confirmed with fish that we tag with OTC. This is a pigment that you insert in the muscle of the fish and it eventually 
shows up in the mark, uh, a dark band in the otolith, and that you can recognize. And for the fish that we've recaptured that were otolith, that were, uh, that were actually um, inserted with OTC, you can see that in fact, for those where you estimate the annual age, those on the upper right graph, the, f the points tend to go in both sides of the one-to-one -one line. But if you look at the uh, lower left graph, which represents the count of daily bands from OTC tag fish versus the time and liberty, again, the daily bands tend to underestimate the time and liberty. So you count fewer bands than the days that they've been out. So both things have actually led us to understand that the only reliable method we have to age fish, certainly adults, and even uh, the sub-adults and all the, ju all the juveniles is annual, annual bands from otoliths. You can have, you can see here the um, growth curve that we've now accepted to be the best representation of the growth of uh, big eye tuna. It was uh, prepared this last uh, April by the scientific group. And you can see that it, it fish uh, grow rather quickly for the first five years of age, and then they uh, slow down considerably in length in terms of the rate of growth. You can also see that we have observations all the way to 17 years of age. So we, for the first time last year, we aged fish beyond 15. And this was a very large uh, change in our perception of the maximum age from 15 to 17, which actually has quite a, was confirmed by also the, the growth rates of the fish that were tagged. That's the upper insert, you know, the growth rate from tagged fish, where you can see how much they grow for a particular time at liberty coincides with the growth rate of the younger fish that we get from the uh, otoliths. But what it means the, to have changed our perception of the maximum age is that we are even more uncertain about the natural mortality of big eye than we actually were before. In this graph, you see the natural mortality that we used in the two, in the last two assessments. In red, you have the natural mortality values that we used in 2018. They change with age because we know that younger fish die at a higher rate naturally than the older fish. And the two red lines represent the two values that we use in the 2018 assessment. On the blue lines represent the three set of values that we're using this year in the big eye assessment. And you can see that they actually span a broader range of mortalities than, than before. So in fact, the um, recent aging that we've done, which is improve our understanding of growth, has only increased, unfortunately, our uh, understanding of mortality. We're probably more accurate so we were probably biased before in the amount of uncertainty there is and also in the direction of that uncertainty. But unfortunately, it means that we still have great uncertainties in terms of um, and, um, natural mortality of, of big eye tumor. So these things are gonna be driving our science and our management. And uh, it really means that we have to look at all the tools to be able to provide useful management advice for the commission. And one of the tools that we are using and that the commission is help, pushing us to use is harvest strategy management, which means to get the commission to agree on a set of actions they would take on the basis of a stock status determination. Presently, they actually can make the decisions uh, depending on the context of that year uh, of the commission, they can make the decisions on the TAC based on our status determination, but they are not bound to make that decision in one or the, or the other. Harvest strategy manages, management actually forces you to agree on what we call a harvest control rule. And a harvest control rule, all it is, is a set of guidance, the, a guidance that tells the commission We've agreed that if the situation of the stock is A, we're gonna do B. 
and if the situation of the group of the stock is C, we're going to do E. So it's a set of pre-agree actions that will take place uh, and that do not allow the commission to negotiate changes and departure from that from those actions. And it's it's a really good management strategy because it really uh, helps when you have uncertainty, especially when you have high uncertainty. So regardless of where you are, even if you're not sure where you are, it always provides the most efficient path to uh, reaching your objectives. And uh, it means that uh, even if the uncertainty is large, like you saw with, with Big Eye Tuna, this path will always be the most efficient path to rebuilding the stock. So harvest strategy management is driving a lot of the science that we're doing. And we, rather than now looking at improvements on biological parameters or basic information, we are also looking at the uncertainty, the global uncertainty in the system so that we can actually support uh, better harvest strategy management and the development of, of harvest control rules. I know that I'm going a little bit long on this, so I'm going to go quickly on this. Um, harvest strategy management and a harvest control rule is basically equivalent to a thermostat. You have some data that you collect, which is in the thermostat is the sensor of the temperature sensor. You have a model that is the uh, uh, internal chip that the sensor has, which makes the air condition go in or out. And uh, the, the actions of the air condition are set by the settings that you put in the, in the thermostat. The harvest strategy management and the harvest control rule is the same thing. It's just a set of data model and actions that are pre-agreed. And what we need to do and where we are investing a lot of information and, and work is in helping the commission choose a thermostat. And choosing a thermostat for us in science means conducting simulations where we use as indicators of performance the status of the stock, whether the stock is going to collapse or not, the future catches and the future stability of the uh, catch limits that are provided. And on the basis of the performance of different models of thermostat or different models of harvest strategies, we provide advice to the commission so that the commission will ultimately uh, choose a harvest strategy that is, uh, helps them best to reach their objectives. For tropical tunas, we are already working on this for a number of years, but we don't plan to have, the current plan is that up until 2024, I believe we won't have basically a winner, winning harvest strategy that the commission could consider um, and could consider adopting. And the reason for that is that being a multi-species stock and multi-gear stock, this is a really challenging uh, endeavor to, to come up and with all the simulations and conduct all the process of, of choosing a, a, a best uh, harvest strategy. Anyway, so just to finish up, you know, I want to remind everybody that, you know, we, we are often uh, used to, in the arts, to accept different in interpretations of the same, the same phenomenon or reality. I've put here some examples of topics that are interpreted very differently by different artists. But in science, we have the same things. We have hypotheses that uh, are often competing hypotheses about how the system works. And we have to cope and accept the fact that those different hypotheses are potentially plausible. And we do that by acknowledging that uncertainty and investing on management strategies like harvest strategy management that explicitly acknowledge that uncertainty. So we need to produce, we know, the best uh, science products and the science products can be only um, done if we are applying some very basic principles of actionable science. Record the assessment criteria properly, keep these assessments simple because we have to communicate it to stakeholders follow an, a, a, a really clear uh, flow of logical uh, work, be consistent and then try to avoid excess complexity, be transparent, 
and acknowledge uncertainty and, and different hypotheses about how the system works. So with that, I want to open it for questions. Uh, I, I was hoping to aim, I was aiming at 30 minutes. I think I've gone about 35. But um, I want to thank the colleagues from, especially from the AOTTP program uh, and all the, all the information that are presented at the symposium we had early this year and the ICAT colleagues from the SCRS. Um, most of my work is funded by a, something called CIMAS, which is a cooperative institute at the University of Miami funded by NOAA and by, funded by funds from NOAA and, and ICAT. And with that, I want to again thank the audience and I'd be thrilled to hear questions or comments in that, that you may want to share with me. Thank you very much, David. Uh, yes, a little bit over the time, but obviously, we personally, I could stay even longer because this is important stuff for our work to, to understand what's the current state of this of research and, and, uh, and the recent developments in, in statistics and, and biology data. So this is very interesting stuff. Um, could you please stop sharing the screen so we can have like a gallery view of, uh, of the speakers now? And we have some questions already. Uh, of course, I, I'll remind the participants, the attendees, that you can still drop any questions or comments in the Q&A box, and we, we take you to do so. Obviously, we have some questions on our side, but we'll start with some questions from the audience. Um, and we have, uh, we have a couple of questions from Yaiza. Thanks, Yaiza. Um, so, David, we'd maybe start um, by a question from Yaiza, where she asks, um, are there also catch comparisons available by number of fish instead of weight? Would this show more clearly the disproportionate number of juveniles caught by uh, per saints? I believe this is relative to the graphs you were showing, uh, where you're showing the, the development or, or the yet yeah, year by year analysis of catch comparisons. Uh, any thoughts on this? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Yaisa, for the question. Uh, we do track uh, catches in numbers. In fact, the population models that we implement uh, are modeling the numbers of fish uh, as opposed to just the biomass. So they are what we call size and age structure population models, which track the evolution of the population from recruits, in this case, zero year olds to older ages all the way to uh, 10 plus. We don't model the the very old fish, because there's very few left in the population. And um, we estimate those population um, abundance in numbers. Now from the fishery, we mostly, most of the catch is uh, provided to us on uh, biomass. So the, the statistics that come from the countries that are members of the commission tend to be on, uh, for, the mo for most of the species, on tons of fish caught. But we also have samples from those catches that allow us to convert those into numbers of different size fish and eventually numbers into different age fish. Uh, for, the, for instance, for the persane, we have very you know, reasonably extensive sampling, which shows that clearly, even though in biomass, they may only represent 30% of the total uh, harvest, probably in terms of numbers, they may represent 60 or 70% of the total catch in terms of number, because obviously there are much smaller fish. So at least twice, I, I don't remember off the top of my head, but probably even greater proportion in, of the catch in numbers is of a juvenile fish. Thank you, uh, David, for the presentation and also these answers. I'll, I'll continue with a question. Another question from Yaiza. Thank you, Yaiza, for your interest and questions we we share as well, I guess. Uh, uh, so uh, Yaiza asks, is the buoy acoustic index influenced by the total number of FADs deployed? Is there sufficient transparency of FAD effort uh, and how this can influence aggregation? Very good question again, Yaisa. So the, let me uh, give a little bit more detail on the, how the buoy index is, is actually produced. As I said, um, the scientists are provided with the acoustic signal from the buoy index, in, from the buoys uh, that are on fads. 
they typically are getting the information only from one section of the fleet. So we've seen analysis from the Spanish um, scientists and analysis from the French scientists. They don't typically share across, uh, unfortunately, that information yet. Um, so it, it is only a portion of the fleet. And um, what they do is they would um, look at a, a signal for a particular buoy they would look at when the biomass uh, signal is interpreted and then they would uh, match it to a position of a hard of a actual per se set that has been also reported by, to them by the same fleet so uh, in cases that where the the per se set has been uh, done after the acoustic signal is interpreted then they can use the data if the per se set is done prior, then obviously it's only the remaining biomass and it's, it's probably not a good. Uh, so they first select those um, acoustic signals where there hasn't been a recent uh, per se set on them. Secondly, they have to actually determine uh, the species composition. The current sensors do not tell you whether the fish underneath the aggregating device is a um, it's a big eye tuna, it's a yellowfin tuna, or it's a mixture of the three species. So what they have to do is, given the location and timing and, and season of, the, of that particular observation from the acoustic sensor, they match it to species composition that comes from historical catches in the same location at the same time of the year. Under the, the assumption that this species composition is spatially and temporally are consistent. That is a strong assumption, one that we, we haven't been able to test yet, and we're only now starting to test with some of the new acoustic buoys that have multiple frequency sensors that can separate at least the um, fish that have no swim bladder, like skipjack, from those that have swim bladder, like big eye and, and yellowfin. So we'll be able to at least, uh, hopefully soon, uh, figure out whether that hypothesis about the species composition being rather predictable to be a good one. Um, so now that I've said, explained where the, 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 the index comes from, they, I'm going to try to answer your question. So they do look at and um, try to isolate individual buoy signals that are far from others. But um, you know, it, is, uh, it is true that there are some hypotheses that the, more, the higher the density of uh, fads in a particular area, the less a school would stay in a single fad. That means that obviously the uh, amount of biomass that is underneath the fad is dependent on the density. Um, that has been work to my knowledge, only that has been able to be done in the uh, Pacific with more fats. These are fats that are tied to the bottom and that therefore their position doesn't change. Doing that with drifting fats, which are the ones that are used for this acoustic signal is much more complicated because you actually have to have the positions of each uh, fat in real time as they move and they get close to one another and separate from one another and in order to be able to estimate uh, density changes in real time. Uh, we're starting to do that work but uh, it, it hasn't been uh, we, far enough for us to test the hypothesis that density of fats of drifting fats actually is affecting the biomass that is underneath the fat. I hope I've asked, answered the question I've, in a very long way but I've answered the question, Lisa. Thanks for that. Thanks for the question. Yeah, thanks, David. And just before we go to other uh, participants, participants' questions, we'll have a, a last one from Yaiza. <laughs> she did like three in a row, so we'll go through those quickly. And this last one is going to be faster as well. She asks, will recent catch data and stock assessment results be available before the, the next intersessional meeting, now in the beginning of September? So, so you, know, you know, we had the meeting in... Um, uh, recently in July of, of the assessment, we had the data preparatory meeting in March, in April, excuse me. We're still working the detailed uh, report. The detailed report of the assessment will be available 
probably in the web page of ICAD, I think sometime in September, prior to the September meeting. Uh, the results that are presented in that ICAT detailed report of the assessment will only be vetted by the SCRS at the first week of October. So although they will be posted, the SCRS will not have accepted that those analyses. And sometimes during the annual meeting, there are changes to the uh, interpretation of the analysis that are conducted in the assessment meeting and the uh, changes to the advice on, on stock status. So you can probably see it in sometime in September, but it will be a preliminary uh, stock status determination that can only be confirmed in the first week of October. Thank you very much, David. And again, thank you, Yaisa, for those very uh, thorough questions and, and which David answered thoroughly as well. Uh, we have a question next from uh, Alberto Martin, um, who asks, considering what you mentioned that the MAC, M -M MSC for tropical tuna will not be ready until 2024, would it be possible and useful to have an interim HCR for big eye tuna that could be developed earlier? As for instance, uh, the one we have for albacore. Yeah, that is a crystal ball that I don't have. And certainly uh, I can tell you there are some, um, some stakeholders in the commission that would like that to be much faster and that have been really pushing for an HCR for big eye tuna to be um, delivered much earlier than that. And potentially, uh, as you say, an, an interim um, uh, HCR like it was for Albacore. Now, the, the reason why I don't, I'm not very hopeful of that is that is the commission has, uh, has a preference of uh, deliver, having a, an MSC, which is for the complex of species as opposed to for one species. We had the conversation about potentially just focusing on big eyes since it's the stock that is in greatest trouble and develop an ACR for, for big eye. But we know from experience that with these tropical tunas, either we tackle the, the management challenge of the three species at the same time, or we is unlikely will be successful, you know, uh, because it's so, they're so tied up and, and, you know, this tremendous pressure from not lowering the ability of the fishery to continue to harvest skipjack uh, in order to pay the price of, of uh, rebuilding the, the, the big eye tuna. So it's, I, I don't think that, that that's going to happen, honestly, but that's my personal opinion. Sure. Thank you, Thank you David. Um, we're we're going to prioritize the questions from the audience, even though we have some of our own, but uh, we have an, a question from Laurence Faconet. Thank you, Laurence. Um, so, uh, many thanks for your interesting presentation. I would be interested to know what is the current knowledge regarding discards in the case of this stock, and if they are accounted for in the stock, uh, if they are accounted for in the stock assessment in particular. Thanks. Thank you. So uh, generally in ICAD, we have a lot of trouble getting uh, good figures and good statistics on discards. Although regulations and obligations of reporting discards are common in ICAD under the legislation and the, the, the commission's uh, resolutions and recommendations, we get very few countries reporting them. And uh, it's been very difficult for the commission, for the, for the committee, for the scientific committee to figure, to find out whether that is honestly uh, the result that there are no discards or there's actually no, the reporting is, is incomplete. We know that there, for some, uh, for some particular years, there's very little discards. We know that some other years like Persanes now have been legislated, uh, have been, sorry, this recommendations from the commission that prohibit uh, discards from the per se, of any of the tropical tuna. So all those species have to be landed. Um, we, those species that are landed that are otherwise would be discarded are landed through typical, uh, what we call channels that are not the normal channels for uh, either the uh, fresh seafood or the canned seafood, and therefore much harder to monitor. This is what in the jargon of ICAR are called faux poisson. 
and uh, we do have statistics on faux poisson, but uh, which are fish that otherwise would have been discarded for, from the per se. Now, discards from the long line are unlikely to be happening because we know those fish are so highly priced that it's very difficult to, to think that they are dis being discarded, although there were some discussions about discards happening in response to catch limits that were imposed on the long lines so that they would be some um, what we call discarding of the smaller sizes of fish in, when the we are approaching the vessel quota and keeping the larger fish, which tend to have a greater value. But, um, so, I mean, all the evidence that we've looked in the scientific committee suggests so far that we have no evidence of that type of discarding happening in the, in the, in the long line. Uh, so to answer your question shortly, we don't have a lot of evidence of, of large discards of big eye tuna. And the ones that uh, we have reported are part of the assessment and that are accounted in the population models. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, we, are, we are reaching the hour mark. And so we, we are going to, to finish. We have no, no other answers from, uh, questions from, from the participants. So we're, we're going to ask you a question of, uh, of our own which is actually to to fold it so uh, of course there are there are climate change is 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 uh, ever more evident uh, and uh, there are movements in in trying to capture the impacts the likely impacts of climate change or the the effects of climate change in in fisheries management and uh, and the other factor which is of course very important and you alluded to it already answering to alberto is the dynamic between the the three the three tropical tuna species. So we would like to ask you what what is currently already being done in terms of the science in incorporating these two factors um, and what should be done, what, what is needed to, to, to be done in the future so that you can have a clearer view of the impacts of these factors and in result have a, a better management of big eye in the future. Thank you. Thank you for that. Those two, those two questions so that two-part question. So in terms of climate change, we do know uh, that uh, clearly the, there are some signals that even the equatorial area uh, of the ocean where these tropical tunas are, uh, live is changing. There is an expansion to the west and north and south of the uh, areas that have warmer waters and less oxygen. This is what we call the area that is depleted of oxygen below the, therm the thermocline, where, you know, basically below which the, the most of these tuna cannot survive. Big Eye is an exception. They can survive below the thermocline, so, but all the other species do not. So we know that that is changing, that through the last few decades is expanding to the west, that tongue of, um, depleted oxygen water is, go, is reaching now close to the coast of Brazil and has been expanding over the last few decades. That means that uh, it's also shrinking in depth uh, in, the, in the east. So the fish are getting uh, less habitat in the east as, the, uh, as that, uh, that area is of, of good oxygen is, is shrinking. And uh, that only makes them more available to the, to the surface fleets like bait boats and, and uh, per se. So we are not unable so far to account for those uh, changes in potential catchability, but we've already started doing work on that. And this work that we are, where we're using ocean content as opposed to just sea surface temperature, ocean content being the integration of the water temperature across the water column at least to uh, 400 or 500 meters, uh, which allows you to have, is an index of habitat suitability, which is better than just uh, surface uh, thermocline water. And um, potentially that will help us um, make some corrections on the estimation of relative abundance derived from, from catch rates by using those uh, ocean content data. 
Um, I think there is little that we've done in the in terms of uh, the northern and southern extents of the distribution of these fish, but uh, clearly, uh, you know, there is some spawning that happens in the of yellowfin tuna in the Gulf of Mexico, and there's clearly also distributions of fish in other parts of the ocean that may also be changing the the, the distribution. We've seen that strongly in temperate fi temperate tuna like bluefin, so. We suspect that climate change is going to continue, uh, where, whether it is to have an impact, whether it's a positive um, or, or negative, I don't think we know. It, it, it potentially could be positive for some species and negative for others, even within the tropical tunas. Um, is it in the radar of the commission? Not so much. I can tell you, not so much. The other uh, question was, what was the second part, sorry? Uh, and regarding the mixing of uh, different uh, tropical oh, the, species. The, the different species. So we haven't looked so much at trophic interactions. Uh, the, the interactions caused by fishing um, by humans are so strong. And so I think we are, are driving so much of the dynamics that we don't think the trophic interactions probably, uh, I mean, there hasn't been put a strong hypothesis that those trophic interactions actually are driving some of the dynamics. Um, so, but, but they could, they could, you know, they have, at least in the juvenile phase, they have a very similar prey uh, feel. The juvenile yellowfin, the juvenile big eye have a similar prey feel than the, than the albacore, that the skipjack adults. And they're probably also predated by the same predators. So potentially there is some trophic interactions and they, that they would depend on the same level of productivity, but we, we've done very little work on that. Yeah, perfect. very interesting nonetheless. And yeah, we imagine that uh, looking at all the work that ICAT has to do and SCRS in particular, obviously the, the priority is to understand the, the fisheries uh, the fisheries impact and not so much the, the, the traffic interaction that, that may exist. But yeah, thank you very much for that. For those enlightening answers to to our questions and to the questions of our of our attendees, we just uh, we just passed the hour mark, which was our our expected timeline for this webinar. So all we have to say is thank you very much, David, for your time and your your availability. Uh, thanks to all the people who joined us for this webinar. Uh, after this kind of summer break, Cien is going to continue with our webinar organization it's been it's been an interesting experience and we see that 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 people take something take something home from this so we'll keep on organizing this for the for the foreseeable future at least with covid or without covid let's hope without covid uh so so again thanks and uh, thank you david good luck for the rest of the i get here let's say and for all that work and thank you and thanks to the audience for, for listening and uh, it, it's been great. I always enjoy this. I hope you have a great rest of the afternoon, wherever you are. And uh, yeah, I'm only starting my day, basically. <laughs> yeah, we know, we, we know you still have some lecture duties later on. So thanks, thanks again for your availability and, uh, and yeah, a great rest of the week to everyone. Thank you. Make sure that you circulate your announcements or webinars with me. I'd like to be in that list. Thank you very much. We'll do so. Okay. Bye, everybody. Yes. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.